Greetings to you again today from Botswana. As you know, this is a part of my uh, video, my mini series on alcohol, alcohol consumption. I hope that you will find it helpful. This is uh, entitled, Why Most Christians Don't Drink. This is something I used to wonder a lot myself, because obviously the Bible does not forbid it, but it does come pretty close. So I want to see some of the principles that are in Scripture concerning this. Why do most Christians not drink? And again, remember, there is not, it is not forbidden, but do as the Lord would show you, because it goes a little bit beyond just whether or not you should drink alcohol, and even beyond whether or not you should be drunken, because if you are drunken, obviously you are in sin and, and you need repentance. That, that is definitely a no-no. And of course, strictly speaking, if you don't drink, you won't get drunk. So please just hear me out patiently. Uh, I will have plenty of, I will have scriptures in the description. I will also have a link to the other video that I had. It's called My Last Drink. And so I hope that you will be blessed by this. The first category that I have here is just simply self-denial. As we read here from Luke 9, 23 and 24, if any man will come after me, that is coming after Jesus, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. When Jesus says to deny yourself, that's very important. This is, in other words, anything that would stand in the way between you and the Lord or representing the Lord well. You know, you must, you should deny yourself. It may not be uh, plainly written in the word, but you will know this by the witness of the Holy Spirit within you. Another part of self-denial, again, I had read this from the other one. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful unto me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Just because we're allowed to do it doesn't mean that we should do it. And remember that in our flesh, our flesh is very weak, and our flesh dwells no good thing. And so it's better to flee from problems than uh, try to overcome them in ourselves. And also I have included with this, I have included this from 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Abstain from all appearance of evil. And you know that often, I mean, people associate drinking with evil. Bad company, bad situations. So it's another reason why we should pull away from it. Then I have bad associations. I have listed two. One of these is very powerful. This is the only thing I'm trying to focus on the New Testament with this to keep this simple. Because we live in the New Testament, you're going to find lots of problems in the, in the Old Testament with drunkenness, and you will. But we live in the New Testament, it is a progression, and this simplifies it a little bit, you know, for your perusal. Although some of the bad examples I will give, they, cut, they are shown from the Old Testament. In the book of Psalms, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. So we see, I mean, how many uh, are delighting in the law of the Lord in a bar? How many are not in the seat of the, are, are not sitting with the scornful or walking with sinners when they're in bars? Obviously, this is bad company, and the Lord tells us to steer away from it. I think also, again, of the simplicity of James 4, verse 4, which simply says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And believe me, if you're drinking, you are the friend of the world, because that is exactly what they want to do. And so we need to be careful of those associations. And that is one of those things people would associate us with. 
For example, even Jesus, when he was speaking of the end times in Matthew 24, at the end of that chapter, or near the end, for, verses 48 to 51, one of the bad things he warned against was eating and drinking with the drunken. So we don't want to do this. These are bad associations, and they should be put away from us. I have another verse here of instruction. This instruction comes from, uh, this is Romans 13, verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Okay, it was 13 and 14. But there you see it. We are not to be walking in drunkenness. This is part of the instruction. And again, I'm telling you, I have more verses that refer to these things. I should have them itemized pretty well in the... Uh, pretty well in the description. So please avail yourself of those resources. But we try to keep these videos, keep the videos short. We see also that there is condemnation, don't we? There is condemnation to those who are, to those who are drunken. We see this also from 1 Corinthians 6. Let me just find that for you so I can read it. It's not just in one place in Scripture. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulteresses, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so we know when we're making this practice out of being drunkards, some might say, well, what is a drunkard? To me, it is, to me, I would say a drunkard could be defined as anyone who deliberately gets drunk, no matter how often they do it. I knew a, a girl that I had worked with one time. I was talking to her on a Saturday, I believe. And uh, it was either Friday or Saturday, but the party she was going to was on Saturday. And she was telling me how she was going to get drunk and call in sick to work on Sunday. Now, I was actually a manager from a different department, but at this point, I figured I'd, do, I'd at least do better not to associate. I was, you know, I was kind of, you know, she was attractive and I was kind of get, trying to get to know her. But at this point, I'm like, well, this doesn't sound very good. And so you see, she would, uh, I would qualify her as that. You may not say that, but I think if someone is going out and getting drunk deliberately, they deserve to be called a drunkard. And they should put that away. God will forgive uh, the drunkard who confesses their sins. Maybe one of the things you've heard at times is I only drink for medicinal purposes. It's kind of a joke with some people. You know, I only do it for medicinal purposes. Well, we have that in the New Testament, but it's only in one place. It is in 1 Timothy 5.23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. I think we all know, we all know that like cough medicine will have a little alcohol in it, such like that. There is some benefit to having small amounts of alcohol in a medicinal way, in a health way. But of course, that must never be an excuse for doing what we are not to do. Um, other things I wanted to mention without reading. First of all, when you look at the instruction to the leaders, to the bishops it was listed two times, to the deacons once, and to aged women once. And that is, it's always saying that they should not be given too much wine. They should not be given too much wine. Always making that a point. Four times with like the, the elder church leaders saying, don't drink a lot. So I call that a significant warning. As we know, and I just wanted to go over this, I mean, drinking leads to problems. Uh, if you go into the Old Testament, you're going to find a lot of counsel against being drunken. You're going to find problems. But the main two, the main two examples that I found to list were from Genesis, because that pertains to God's people. The first one would have been with Noah. You may remember from Genesis chapter 9 that Noah was drinking and he got drunk. These were in the days after the flood. 
And his one son came and saw his nakedness. And this was a great shame to him. And he kind of was making fun of what he had seen. It did not go well for him because he was very disrespectful. That was Ham. Uh, however, obviously Noah got drunk. And it doesn't say that he got drunk unwillingly. And so this led to other problems that were out of his control. And then we see also from Genesis 19, this would have been with Lot and the two unmarried daughters of Lot after they had escaped Sodom and Gomorrah and then they had fled the small city Zoar. His two, his, uh, two daughters, especially the elder one, got the idea, well, we don't have husbands and, and uh, my father's name might be blotted out from uh, heaven and, and we should carry on the family name. And so they deliberately got Lot, their father, drunk. So much so, he didn't even know what was going on. And his daughters had intercourse with him. They became pregnant. And you can obviously th see this is a very, very, very bad thing. But this is what happens when we are drunken. And so if you look at that first video I have, you'll know that for a long time, I stood by the fact that I was allowed to drink, but I didn't need to. There may be situations you don't feel this way. Maybe there's, maybe you don't have such good water or something like this. You must use discernment. But for myself, I thought it was best to put away the drinking. And I can see why most Christians do. The Bible really steers us away from it in terms of our witness, in terms of the associations that we get into. It's just not good. So I pray that this might be a blessing to you and answer some questions. I hope that the Lord will quicken it to you according to his will. Have a good day.